Happy, ah, we are being recorded. Happy Saturday morning, afternoon. Nobody, nobody from Australia today. Mel's probably celebrating his birthday already. Um, so no Saturday morning, Sunday morning people. Um, we are gathered here after a two week break. My apologies for the second week of that. Um, I'm trying to get back in the in the mode of how we do this. Uh, anyway, we have a speaker joining us this morning who has been dancing since 2006, calling since 2009, three year dancing into calling. It's, you know, some of those people just do that. <laughs> um, calls basic through 3CA, C3A, sorry about that. Uh, and he learned to, to, to dance and probably to call at Tech Squares in Cambridge um, from Ted Lazat and got to the point now where he fills in for Ted when sometimes when Ted's not available. Um, he's a member of Caller Lab and <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm reading my notes and I wrote down definitions and autocorrect put it as defibrillates <laughs> he is chairman and currently chairman of the defibrillates committee at <laughs> color lab having taken over from clark baker recently well it's been a couple of years already hasn't it guy yeah um and those of you in the computer field may also know him because he's quite um accomplished in that field also um from Lexington, Massachusetts, let's have a big hand for Guy Steele. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to attempt to share the screen now. Um, you should be able to. We have turned on all of the appropriate settings. Yay! We see your donbeckzoom.pdf. Good. Okay, that's exactly what I want. Okay, so I'm going to begin this. This talk is about um, primarily about formations and ways of diagramming them. But in order to see what some of the problems are, I'd like to talk about a little bit about the uh, familiar uh, four factor description of uh, dancers on the floor, which we call phaser, which is usually described as formation, arrangement, sequence, and relationship. And um, let's see, I need to put this into the correct mode. That's better. Okay, um, so formation uh, typically consists of two different factors. One is uh, the geometry of, the, of where the dancers are on the floor. It's sometimes referred to as the shape of the spots on the floor. But another important thing is that formation may include, although it does not always, include the facing directions of the dancers relative to that geometry, as opposed to their facing direction relative to, to head and side walls. So here, for example, I've illustrated a formation that we call uh, two-faced lines. Uh, in fact, they are left-handed two-faced lines. And there's another version which they are right-handed. Uh, we can do more. Uh, we can distinguish the boys from the girls, for example. And this is called paying attention to arrangement. When we're talking just about formations, we ignore where the boys are and the girls are because arrangement is a separate consideration. And so here, in fact, I've chosen to put the boys in the center so that we have normal couples and they're all uh, uh, facing promenade direction around the square. Sequence and relationship are additional things that we could decorate the diagram with. Sequence refers to the order of boys and the order of girls. So for example, here the uh, boys are out of order. If you uh, f trace the sequence of the boys in promenade direction, it's four, three, two, one, rather than uh, four, one, two, three, which would be in order. So the boys are out of sequence here. And in fact, the girls are also out of sequence. And that's fine because they're out of sequence together and they're having a good time. Everybody's paired up with this partner. This is great. Well, I said everyone's paired up with this partner. In this particular example, that's a question of relationship. Which boy is with which girl? So here I, uh, I've got uh, every boy with his partner, but I could ha have each boy with his corner or his right-hand lady or his opposite lady. 
Uh, even this doesn't capture everything you might want to say about where the dancers are on the floor. So a subtle consideration that is often ignored, in fact, I don't know of a good standard term for this, I call it parity, which is the heads versus sides. You can take a, a formation here, such as the one on the left, where the heads happen to be the leads. But I can make the sides be the leads instead. They're still in the same sequence. They're still in the same relationship. It's just a question of which ones happen to be the leads. Uh, we make less of a fuss about this because this distinction turns out to be less choreographically relevant than the other four categories. And another uh, piece of information about where the spots are on the floor is orientation or rotation distance. Uh, this is in effect how far you are from home. We care about orientation primarily when we're doing singing calls and we're worrying about the promenade distance from home and whether we'll time out with the music. But um, another uh, thing you might want to worry about is, um, am I going to get a bullseye? So for example, from the formation on the left, I can tell that if I call Ferris wheel, center sweep a quarter and back away. Then, in fact, I'll have a bullseye get up because everyone will end up at home. But that wouldn't work for the one that's in the middle because they would end up in the wrong place. So that's orientation. It's a, that's a 0 to 360 degrees measure. And it's even possible to have tilted formations, such as the one shown on the right. That's, that's tilted at 45 degrees. And those are all matters of orientation. But even that isn't everything you might want to put in a diagram. For example, uh, there is the question of breathing. So here I've shown uh, three examples of uh, what seem to be lines back to back. And for some purposes, all of these are the same formation in that we consider them all to be lines back to back, even though the two lines are at different distances from each other. And it kind of depends on how they got created. So for example, the diagram in the middle is what you usually get when you have the dancers pass through. Uh, they tend to go a little farther than you might think because dancers are usually more comfortable that way, particularly if they then turn around. The dancers like to have space in front of them to work with. And so typically parallel lines will be about as far as part as shown in the center diagram. But if we had started with a column fa facing the side walls that had everybody face out, we might get the diagram on the left. Because they were just holding hands, they're really close together in a nice tight compact formation. So if we just have them face out in place, we'll get the diagram on the left. <laughs> On the other, other hand, if I got, got there by, to back-to-back -back lines by saying double pass-through put centers in, then they will tend to be very far apart because uh, the leads after that double pass-through will have slid apart. They're at quite some distance. The centers have stepped in. And usually from there, the caller's dogs will say, whoa, I've got them far apart. I need to do something to get them back together again. And from here, you might do chase right or cast off three quarters, do something else to kind of bring them back together again. So these are matters of square breathing usually. On the other hand, if I got to that center diagram because I was a calling challenge and had the dancers in triple lines and do, did various kinds of press aheads, they might logically be on a three by four grid and it just turns out the middle row is empty. So that middle diagram could describe lines back to back just after a pass through or it could describe the outer lines of a set of three lines of triple lines. So it depends on how you got there and what the dancers are thinking, not just exactly where on the floor. So this is a lot of stuff to try to capture in a diagram and uh, we're making a diagram do lots of work. And even this isn't everything you might want to put in a diagram. Uh, you might, for example, want to show handholds. And there are various schools of thought as to how to do this. On the left, I show the style of hand of handhold diagram where the dancers are holding their hands straight out to the sides. And that's useful for some purposes. On the other hand, real dancers don't hold their hands straight out to the sides all the time. They might do it if they're diamond points. But if they're just comfortably having a, a partner handhold, they tend to hold their hands a little bit forward. And that's shown in the right-hand diagram over there. So that shows what it might look like after dancers pass through. I'm not showing the breathing, but I am showing what happens after they retake the handholds and their hands are a little bit forward of them. So uh, there are lots of choices about what you express in a diagram. And part of the point of what I want to talk about today is that no one style of diagram satisfies all purposes. Different kinds of diagrams capture choreographically relevant uh, information. And it turns out no one single diagram can capture everything that's choreographically relevant. So um, with that, I'm going to share a different screen now. I'm going to stop this share.
share a different screen. Not the desktop. There we go. So you should now see Taminations. Okay, and uh, I have shown here a left hand two faced line. And I'm just going to have these dancers do an as couples face your partner. We usually call that bend the line, but that's really what it is, an as couples face your partner. And thinking about it as, as couples face your partner helps you to focus on the fact that um, each pair of partners, each couple is going to pivot on the handhold between them. And if those lines were really close together, there wouldn't be enough room. They'd have to make space. But Taminations uh, 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 chose a, a breathed out version of the diagram so that when I run the animation, you really can pivot nicely on the handhold in the center and they end up in nice facing lines that are still breathed apart. And this is a lot of the essence of square breathing. Dancers kind of, we teach dancers to do this. So that- Hey, they, Don. Uh, yes, Clark. The diagram I've seen on my screen share has been lines facing the whole time with no animation. It oh, looks as though the animation is at the end of the uh, of the terminations. So you need to like drag the slider back and then do play again, I think. Okay, I have I've just now dragged the slider back. Are you seeing no change? I am seeing no change. Oh dear. I don't know why that is. Let me unshare and reshare and see if that makes a difference. Okay. We do see your, your cursor moving, so it is live. Okay, that's good. You, you could also, yeah. Okay, I've stopped the share. I will reshare. Okay, do you see the two faced lines? Yes. Do you see the animation? Yes. Okay, good. That's what I needed. Yay. Okay, so to repeat that animation, uh, notice that each couple's couple managed to pivot on its handhold. And because they are breathed apart and end up breathed apart, uh, this animation works perfectly and they, they pivot in place and everything's cool. Whereas if they had started with those lines closer together, there would have been some pushing of shoulders together to get breathed out vertically to make it work. Okay, on the other hand, uh, there's another uh, animation I would like to show you. Let's go to advanced A1 and pick, um, let's say, um, quarter in. And let's do that from lines facing out. Okay, here we see the breathed apart lines back to back. Watch what happens when I do quarter in. Contaminations realized those dances couldn't just dance in place. They needed to get close enough to do those handholds. And we're familiar with the fact that dancers will do this adjust breathing adjustment so as to get close enough to hold hands. On the other hand, uh, if I go back and look at face in, I'm going to go back to basic one. Let's try face right from facing couples. There we go. Notice that Taminations, in this Tamination, uh, the couples are already very close together. They are not breathed apart. And this is kind of a cheat. So that when I ask them to face right, you won't see them have to do that sideways adjustment. They're already ready to take left hands. And if they had been far apart, then they would have had to do that same slide together thing we saw in quarter in. Okay, with all that as background, um, now I want to talk about the fact that Caller Lab has standard formations documents. And I'm going to share a different screen. I've got a document to show you. There we are. Okay, if I'm lucky, you're now seeing the um, three-page Caller lab, for, lab Formations document. It should say Caller Lab Formations Pictograms at the top. We are. Good. And there are three pages of these. I'll just kind of scroll through them. 
and it shows a whole pile of different kinds of lines. Uh, here, number 33 is the ends in inverted lines. You got the ends out inverted lines. You got T-bone lines. A lot of emphasis on lines. Uh, down here, you see various kinds of columns, and uh, a couple of hourglasses are shown. There's uh, interlocked diamonds. So there are 79 uh, diagrams shown. And uh, one of the things I was paying to as I took over from Clark was that this pictograms document had not been updated in 10 years. Now it's been 12 years. And so the committee has been focusing on a new draft instead of having three pages of pictograms has about 17 pages. Because <laughs> it turns out a lot got left out. Um, and it also, the order in which they appeared kind of seemed to be the order in which someone happened to think of them. We thought a little bit more about organization. Now, notice some things about the diagrams that we're seeing here. Uh, they do not show arrangements. There is a separate doc, Color Labs document called Formations and Arrangements. And that document is actually managed by the Choreographic Applications Committee rather than the Definitions Committee. So if you want to see where the girls and the boys are, you want that formations and arrangements document. And that's the thing that defines things like zero lines, zero boxes, one half lines, number three lines, and so forth. That's worried about where the boys and girls are. So in this color lab formations pictograms document, we don't show boys and girls. Every dancer is shown as a circle. Uh, the little black dots show facing directions. Those are called the noses. Uh, you can see that in some cases, uh, for example, in, di in diagram number six, facing couples, the couples are shown as being somewhat breathed apart. And the same is true here in diagram number 10, right hand box circulate. On the other hand, down here at number 23, eight chain through, they are shown in a tight two by four formation. Uh, so the couples are not shown as having extra distance between them, even though dancers will sometimes do that. Uh, on the other hand, on the parallel two-faced lines here, number 20 line, those two-faced lines are shown as being breathed apart. So these are some aesthetic choices that were made as these diagrams were being produced. And whether you show the breathing or not kind of depends on what your pedagogic purpose is in constructing these pictograms. Okay, now I'm going to share a different screen. Stop the share. Share the screen. And ah, for some reason that window is not open. Give me just a moment. Here we are. Okay, cancel the share, restart the share. Sorry, this is taking so much time. Guy, there is a button at the top that allows you to go from one share to another without having to drop out. But... Uh, new share, okay, I'll do it that way. Thank you. I. You know, like so many people who are not completely expert computers, once I find one that way that works, I stick to it, even if it's not the most efficient. But not a problem. For, but I thank you for that advice. Okay, you should be seeing the Color Web Formations pictogram document now. Yes. This is our current working draft. And there is the table of contents. You'll see that it has about eight pages of preface uh, with a lot of text explaining much of what I've explained to you, in fact, things about breathing and handholds and so forth. And I'll look some more of that text in a minute. I've probably got another five minutes I want to talk about, and then we can go to a discussion. But you'll see here from this um, table of contents that we have arranged the formations by program. And this is a rough guess as to at what program a given formation and its names really become widely used and useful in having choreographic discussions. So this is not to say that you can't make an hourglass at mainstream. You certainly can. It's just that we don't talk much about hourglasses at mainstream. So we've chosen to file hourglass under the advanced section. So we've got two pages of basic and mainstream formations, another page for plus, another page for advanced. And then at C1, there's another seven pages. You can, and this really brought home to me this exercise, the fact that, yes, challenge is when the formation variety really explodes. 
And I hadn't realized just how many dozens of formations I had learned in taking a, a year long C1 class. It was really as much learning about wild formations as learning new calls. And that's what makes it a challenge. And then there are three more pages at C2 and one page at C3A. So let's just take a quick look at some of these. Here's the first page of uh, our, the draft uh, for the basic mainstream formations. Uh, they are organized, first of all, uh, inspired by the previous generation document, by the number of dancers in the formation. So first we have various two dancer formations, and then four dancer formations, and then eight dancer formations. So here we see couples, right hand mini ways, facing dancers, back to back dancers. We see lines of four of various kinds, both lines and columns. Uh, notice that as in the previous document, some dancers have two noses. And this is a way of making one diagram stand for several different kinds of formations. So when a dancer has two noses, it means the dancer may face in either direction. And that choice may be made independently for every dancer in the diagram. So when I have this number seven general line of four, this actually represents eight different diagrams because each of the four dancers could be facing in different directions. It actually, it's eight different diagrams. It's not actually eight different formations because there are some symmetries. So for example, there's only one kind of inverted line even though there are two possible diagrams in this orientation that show that. And down at the bottom of this page, we see the various the circular formations like squared sets and Alamo rings, circles of eight. On the next page, we see VARs and various promenades. We see uh, various kinds of lines facing lines, lines facing out, eight chain through, some tidal waves here at the bottom. That's about it. Um, notice that we've chosen not to show handholds and we've chosen not to show breathing. Um, the original, and this by the way, is this being a subject of debate as we speak in the committee as to whether we should hold handholds or not and how much breathing we should show. Uh, but the, this particular set of diagrams was, chose, was uh, drawn with the principle that we never show breathing, or to put it more precisely, we assume that all dancers have breathed inward as much as possible. This allows us to show one canonical diagram, for example, parallel facing lines. We don't need to show various, several versions with, them at, uh, with lines at different distances. So the emphasis here is on being able to compare different formations. So you can see the relationship between parallel lines and parallel columns, for example. They are both examples of the two by four grid. There are lots of formations that are basically a two by four grid. And the question of whether that grid has been breathed apart in various ways is a separate consideration that we've chosen not to show in this set of diagrams. And again, that's a matter of debate. Uh, I'll scroll down here to challenge. Down here in challenge, we become more interested in talking about pure geometries without facing directions. So we see a lot more names for diagrams that just describe geometries, like two by twos, two by threes, two by fours, uh, Z spots without worrying about exactly which way the dancers are facing on the Z. Here are twin diamond spots, uh, but the dancers could all be facing into the center of the diamond. That's fine. Uh, we see some triangles here and so forth. So I'm not going to lead you through the whole catalog of formations, just to show you that there are a lot of them. And perhaps the most important thing about this version of the document is that we put an index at the end. So if you know the name, you can find the diagram. So that's a good thing. I'm going to finish up by talking just a little bit about handholds. Um, I've shown you a couple of styles of uh, handhold diagram already. There's another very interesting one that is done by Guido Haas. And uh, I'm going to do a new share. There we go. And in this document, uh, you can see at the bottom of this first page, I'm going to move it up to the middle, dancers are shown as little hexagons that uh, are not circular or square. And you can see the fronts and backs of the dancers better. This better portrays the fact that, you know, dancers are wider shoulder to shoulder than they are front to back. And also shows the hands as being held forward a little bit. And in the diagrams, you can see uh, that a couple has the dancers standing side by side. 
But in many ways, they're slightly offset. I refer to this as the wave offset. And this is something that Guido places a lot of emphasis on. <clears throat> so he's very much about showing waves as if they look like they are wavy. So um, let me go down here. Um, here we are. <clears throat> so on this page, we see straight lines. But a, a two-faced line, a left-hand and a right-hand two-faced line, show the slight offset between those who are facing down and those who are facing up. And in a wave, the wave really does look wave-like. So there's a problem, though, with that if we always had diagrams that show this wave offset, <clears throat> then it would be very funny describing a U-turn back as turn around exactly in place. Because if I'm in a wave and everybody U-turn back, and they all U-turn back in exactly in place, then they will be offset the wrong way for their wave. And I've actually paid some, paid some attention, done experiments. And when a real square dancer does a U-turn back from a wave, they step forward slightly before turning around, or as a smooth motion with the turning around, so as to compensate for that wave offset. They know that offset is coming, and they prepare for it. And so, in some sense, our definitions that say a U-turn back or a quarter right are always in place without moving are, in fact, a lie. Dancers actually do make these small adjustments, but they are not mentioned in the definitions, and they are typically not always shown in the diagrams. So that is food for thought that I want to feed into this discussion. So I'm going to just switch, do one more share before I uh, turn it over for discussion, and that is to switch back to that working draft. And I'm going to go to some of the text in the middle um, here, where I do show some handholds. So at the top of this page, here are what uh, diagrams might like look like when the, the handholds are completely sideways. This allows you to show the handholds, but to maintain this, this the strict grid structure. So facing lines and right-hand columns exhibit the same two by four grid. <clears throat> and you could do a quarter right in place and turn one into the other. On the other hand, done. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat from talking. Down here near the bottom, uh, I have shown diagrams that show not only handholds, but also in some cases some breathing. So the mini wave is a little offset relative to the couple. Here in this right hand quarter tag, you can see that the center wave is actually shown as being wavy. In order to depict that, I had to move the outsides outward a little bit. So I have breathed those out. On the other hand, for these ocean waves here, I did not breathe the ocean waves apart. And they really look kind of crammed. It's really kind of hard to tell one wave from the other. And this diagram might serve a better pedagogic purpose if those two waves were also breathed apart a little bit toward the side walls. Uh, in these last two diagrams, with the hand shown, holding, sh uh, shown being held forward, in an eight chain through, you can comfortably show them in a pretty reasonable grid. But if we switch to right hand columns, then in fact, they are offset by a fair amount. And it's pretty clear they are no longer on a two by four grid. And in fact, if you asked real dancers to form right hand columns and then said, look for the triangles, they might find them. So that's something a caller needs to be aware of. And my la final remark is that in my mind, part of the art of being a caller is using these diagrams as mental models in order to relate different formations to each other and being able to spot when a single placement of the dancers on the floor can be regarded as more than one kind of formation. This allows you to do change of focus, which lends interest to the calling. Okay, so that is about the end of my presentation, and I think it's time to turn it over to uh, talking. Is this interesting? Do you have other topics you want to raise? Thank you. So at this point, um, wow, guy, thank you. Great presentation. Uh -huh. um, a lot of interesting stuff. Um, and let's hear from people like Clark, who's pointing at the ceiling. So um, you didn't answer the question that was on my mind the whole time. Say it, and I'll give an answer, and then see see what you think. And in fact, Color Labs, 
information document, um, which I believe was done by Bill Davis and a committee, a formations committee, um, doesn't really answer the question either. Basically, why do we need this document and what is it for? And that gets back to something that we kind of, we all know implicitly and we don't think a lot about it, but sometimes trying to explain it and write it down really hard. And that's like, what do various words mean and why can we communicate by writing and talking to each other? And that's because we have some common knowledge, usage, and meaning of a word. Like if I say chair, you know what a chair is and you know it has properties and I can probably sit in it and it probably has three or four legs and it might have a back and so forth. Um, as callers, we need to communicate. Uh, we need to communicate with each other um, as equals. We need to communicate with each other when one is training another. And we need to communicate with our dancers. And there's a language, a square dance language that's been developed. And part of that language, I'm not big on saying nouns and verbs and pronouns, but maybe you could think of formations as being some sort of part of speech, is we have these shapes on the floor that that guy described originally. And when I say, hey, I have some dancers in an ocean wave and I want to do this call, or you know, Don Beck in, in the old day, hey Clark, I have a new call. It's done from parallel waves. Well, when he says parallel waves, I know what he's talking about right off the bat. And that's because we're communicating, because we have these words, these phrases. And at some point, Color Lab decided, let's document those. So we have a common language because where's scoot back done from a box of four? Well, some callers, a box of four means one thing. Other people might call it a scoot back box. Other people might call it a two by two in a right, you know, or something. I don't know. So that's why we have the formations document is so that we can map words, right hand ocean waves into a picture that lets us know what they are. Now, Guy in lots of detail went into how detailed those pictures need to be and what exactly are they trying to represent in much the same way that callers think of you turn back as turning around in place. And hey, that's a pretty simple thing. So the definition of you turn back should be trivial. We also know that it may, accomplish, may be accompanied with some breathing. And if we don't explain breathing somewhere, then we haven't really captured how all of this activity works. Now we don't have to capture how the activity works as part of how dancers learn and execute the activity, but we may need to capture it for how we train and communicate. And I will kind of stop there. No noise, no comments. <laughs> um, okay, I'll jump in. I've got a response. I didn't want to hog, hog the airwaves. I want to give people a, a chance. I'm going to share my screen again. You and I get to hog. I'm the MC <laughs> and the presenter. <laughs> you, Pete, you'll find out that I interject all too often. Okay, I'm taking us back to this formation's working draft. One thing I want to call your attention to is that some of the diagrams, such as eight chain through, have one name. No, this is eight chain through. That's what that looks like. Uh, given that, of course, that the diagram makes no attempt to capture breathing or handholds. It's assumed that if dancers are side by side, they'll take hands. And we've chosen not to show the breathing for reasons I've explained already. But this is the eight chain through diagram. And there's a one to one correspondence between this geometry and set of facing directions and that name. Eight chain through means that. And that has the only name eight chain through. On the other hand, if we look at number 41, the double pass through formation, it's got a bunch of different names that are used in different contexts and for different reasons. So its official name is given first. It is the double pass through, and you can add the word formation. Why would you add the word formation? Well, because double pass through is also the name of a call. And sometimes we need to distinguish the name of the call from the name of the formation. Other ways of say, distinguishing that, some callers like to say a starting double pass through. And that clearly indicates that's a formation name and not a call name. 
you know, if you start to say double, if you're talking to dancers, you know, you've, you've stopped the music, you're talking to dancers on the mic, you're teaching. You say, I want to talk about double pass through. And before you can say the word formation, they've already taken off. So putting the word starting up there uh, helps. On the other hand, another name is for this formation when you're talking about tag formations is zero tag. And zero tag is followed by quarter tag, half tag, three quarter tag, and then full tag, which is another name for the completed double pass through. So in this document, we, in this version of the document, we are trying to, on the one hand, give a standard name for each formation for use in the definitions. But on the other hand, capturing all the other names that callers are in fact using in practice to talk to each other or talk to dancers. And we consider these to be secondary or subsidiary names. We hope that's a useful organization. That's the uh, starting touch by quarter and a quarter formation. <laughs> Guy, just, just for laughs, but before the tag the line family of zero, quarter, etc. cetera, um, I was trying to get a quarter tag formation known to be called a ping pong formation. Um, <laughs> But I, I'm glad that didn't happen. I like the quarter tag much better. <laughs> uh, particularly given that, as we've discovered, you can do ping pong circulate for formations other than quarter tag. It's really obscure, but you can do it. So for example, you can do ping pong circulate from a three quarter tag. The circulate paths are there. They're really hard for the dancers to see. And we checked this with you, Don. You said it was OK. So Ted Lazat and I have been using that on very rare occasions for fun. <laughs> Does that end in parallel waves? Uh, no, it ends back up at a quarter tag. Oh, okay. In effect, for a three-quarter tag, you are doing facing circulates on the ping-pong circulate paths. Okay, I was thinking circulating the same path. I'm, all right, I'm with you. Yeah, um, <laughs> the um, it, one thing you mentioned is that you're not showing which the men are and which the women are. You're not showing arrangements. Um, Boy, would your document be long if you did that, since the, every picture you have has six possible arrangements. So a very wise choice not to show that. Yes, if the Choreographic Applications Committee wants to make the arrangements version of this document, and it's 60 pages long, I will help, <laughs> but I'm not going to start it. <laughs> good, good, good. This raises another point, which is that something I didn't talk about was that in this version of the document, if a formation has both right hand and left hand versions, we're showing only the right hand version. My original draft showed both because the 2010 document showed both. It showed right hand ways and left hand ways. But this adds another seven pages to the document when you show the left hand page versions of this many formations. And so the committee asked to see a version without the left hand version, without the left hand forms of the formations. And now we're getting some pushback from the other side. Some callers are saying, ah, it's really useful to see the left-hand versions, uh, particularly for at basic and mainstream and plus. So the committee is hashing through exactly how much of that detail we want to include explicitly. Why does formation diagrams come under the auspices of um, definitions committee? I have no idea. OK, great answer. I, I, would, on that one. I would argue that lab created and destroyed committees all the time to do tasks like let's have a committee to do formations let's have a committee to document mainstream do mainstream definitions let's do styling let's do timing and as their work got done um the committees went away and at the time color lab didn't think about the maintenance efforts of all the documents and all the work they'd done and when it came time to start doing that, um, the definitions committee had kind of been reconstituted and um, first as a subcommittee under the program policy committee. Um, Kip Garvey was head of program policy and I was head of that subcommittee. And then it turned into a real committee. And I think at the moment we quote own formations, definitions and um, well, actually, we advise on definitions. That's a kind of a weird thing because each individual program committee didn't want to give up control of their definitions. So we write them and they approve them. But styling is under formations at the, or under the definitions committee at the moment. And timing is also. 
because there's no one else around to do it anymore. And kind of, I don't think it's such an important thing that they need to form up a whole committee that would have enough work to do it. Joe? Uh, yeah, I, I think it fits under the definitions uh, pretty well because when you define a call, you have to determine what, what formation you're doing it from. Um, two, other, two other points are to Clark's um, uh, point about communications and speech, it's especially when we talk about you turn back being a turnaround, uh, that's, that's wrong. Uh, turn around is 360 degrees. A <laughs> U-turn back is 180. Uh, I got that brought up when I was teaching a basic class and a challenged answer was there. <laughs> and I said, all you have to do on this call is turn around. And he did. <laughs> I called him out on it and he said, well, I'm doing it. <laughs> you know, so I, uh, that was that one. Um, under the formations as well, if you look at pretty much everything at mainstream, and you can go right into some of the challenge stuff, a lot of it, everything really is based on a circle. Uh, if you if you breathe the centers on any line or uh, eight chain through setup or whatever, you really have a circle, um, which it can explain an awful lot about the, our choreography. Uh, it, the point to be made is when we have the uh, formation of uh, a corner box and we have the uh, people slide through and square through three, everybody's facing out, their original corner is on their right. And of course, in the very first class, I told everybody that they're part to the guys, your partner is the person on your right. So after the square through three, and I say, swing your corner, uh, one guy came up finally, he said, but you told me that's my partner. How can that be my corner? Well, if everybody turns back around in that big circle, you got the circle, you're back in sequence, you know, it, so things are relative to the center of that circle. Um, so a lot of the um, choreography uh, that we have can be related to just a circle. I don't know what application that has, but <laughs> uh, or, or how it would help anybody. But I, uh, even though we, these formations are so de detailed and technical, um, I love them. We, we, you know, it's how we, as Clark said, that's how we communicate. So keep going. <laughs> Since there's a lull here, um, Guy, just for your information, for your curiosity or what have you, when I do square dance dolls or checkers to move around, rather than using squares and circles, I, I like to use arms. I don't use noses, but arms. Um, see if I can hold these up. These are arms. I like to show hands holding if they're boys right and girls left. So if they're normal couples, they're holding hands. If they're half sashayed couples, they're not. And I can see that quickly. And also, if I'm in a wave, I don't have to be offset to see the waviness of it. I can just follow maybe even easier without the numbers. And I hesitated to hold up four, but without being offset, my dolls, you can see the, the hands create the wave kind of thing. Um, but I find the boy right, girl left hand, obviously in your diagrams, that wouldn't work. But um, I find that really handy when I'm moving my dolls around a quick look to see if they're half sash hate or not. You actually raise a good point, which is that I didn't get into, which is that uh, there are styles of hand, di diagrammed handholds where you always show both arms for all dancers. And there are other styles in which you only show the hands that are being used to hold onto someone else's hand. And those two, two kinds of diagrams kind of look different in my eyes. And uh, if you're focusing on just where the handholds are, maybe you just want to show the handholds in use. But if you're trying to see the wave, maybe you want to see the extra arms flapping off the end of the wave. I don't know. So what is the progress of this document? What, what's the time schedule? Um, right now it's in my hands and I've been busy doing stuff like Zoom meetings and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, my understanding is I am on the hook to produce a new draft of the document that uh, 
shows versions of diagrams both with and without handholds and with and without the left-handed versions of the formations so the committee can get an idea of what those diagrams would look like and how much longer it might make the document. We will probably then have a discussion as to whether we, we want to keep both kinds of diagram, making them available for different purposes. And if so, should they be uh, sections of a single document or split off into two documents? So that's what I think the, dis the discussion is going to be going forward this fall. I need a few more weeks to prepare that revision. Now, I was having thought breathing here, and I missed slightly, but you say it's in your hands to then present to the rest of the committee. Uh, purely because I have two hats on. I am the chair of the committee, so I'm running the discussion. I also happen to be the volunteer project editor for this document. <laughs> so everybody else says, oh, I want these changes. I'm the guy who actually sits down at the text <laughs> editor and makes the changes. And with that's your a different phones hat. With your headphones on, it looks like two hats, one over this year and one over that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I noticed Keith has his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Good. Thank you, Jan. Keith? Yes, I must both unmute and lower my hand or I'll forget. <laughs> you know, there's an interesting thing I came across a couple of months ago and I said, okay, why would you want to use the call step through instead of pass through? And then I looked at the definition for pass through and I noticed that you have to pass right shoulders and pass through. So you better use step through if you're in a left handed wave. Um, so it's a much more versatile call. But here's my question pass the ocean, pass through, let's say from a static square, heads or sides pass the ocean, pass through. Well, I would probably make most dancers to go uh, stand on uh, right on top of the dancers that they're facing after they pass through and depends upon how much room there is there. And I think a lot of uh, of people that I've called to in the past would just go ahead and figure they want that I wanted an extend and they just step into a wave with the guys. Uh, but, uh, you know, an interesting consideration is one has got to give more breathing room than the other. Uh, between the dancers that have performed the call. And I would think that that, pa that uh, pass through would put them further apart back to back than step through. Does anybody care to render an opinion on that whole thing? Anybody? Silence. <laughs> Guy I would think would have a... <laughs> I do have opinions, but I'm trying to give other people a chance to talk. But since you ask, um, <laughs> I know too much, and I know that pass through and step through are logically the same. Yeah. And so, I is knowing that, then when I am dancing, I would make sure that the two give the same result. Yes, I, I certainly agree. There's a pitfall there, and dancers might interpret misinterpret what you want because it's such an unusual thing to call. Um, so. Um, I guess my other comment is, what about what about the outsides? So you have the sides pass the ocean and step through. What about the heads? This is the special case of breathing known as counter dancing, which is inactives, inactives having to move just to make room for the people who are really doing the call. And that's an important consideration too. And again, something that's not well captured by static diagrams. I think it is something that is well captured by tool like terminations. <clears throat> are you guys saying that um i got evicted <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> are, um are, are, you, are you saying that you think that uh step through and pass through you expect a, a different result from the dancers me or, or um, the 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 only time i use uh step I, I just use step through from a wave uh and i wouldn't say pass through from there uh because i think the dancers if you say pass through uh i mean you know we know and they depending on what level they're at know that that's uh that a mini wave is could be logically you know facing dancers or whatever but the but if you but if you say step through to people who are who think they're side by side and are not looking the person in the eye because they're a little past them and they're going to be wondering who do I, I I don't see anyone to pass through with yeah so, so that's that's the reason for saying step through 
but but they know that any time that they go through, uh, or or most of the time, uh, that uh, you know that they're still going to make that uh, they're still going to slide back together to make that uh, pass through adjustment or not, depending on you know what the next call is. But 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 I don't uh, but I don't think it's uh, I'm I'm not expecting a different result. Than I would have gotten from pass through, and so no extra breathing room or less breathing room or anything like that between the backs of those dancers that just did the move. No, I think that they'll breathe back in as much as they would have if it was pass through. But I mean, there's a there's a delivery and a timing issue here, which is you know depending on the next call, they might not uh, have time or or need to think. Oh, I need to get in, you know, back in some formation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it depends on the dancers, and you know, if you do that with uh, C four dancers or somebody, then they're probably going to make that adjustment uh, unless you really cause them not to by you know calling something immediately. If you if you call that to a mainstream floor, they'll they'll do what they you know they'll they'll do with a little bit more like on a pass through. Even they'll they'll go through, and then there'll be a, a slight uh, a, you know a third of a second calculation in their mind about I wonder if I should move now right and and they might they might they might not breathe in for a little while until they get bored which might take you know a whole second yeah. uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying yeah. uh, well I I do and you know the thing is I, I I guess this is another one of those cases where the definitions clearly say that from an ocean wave or at least a right hand one you can use pass uh, through, but it's another one of those things where just because you can doesn't mean you should. And step through is pretty clear compared to that one. Yeah, yeah. Clark? So someone other than Guy and Chris answer the question of why does the formations document, especially the new one, have uh one by four formation called a general line you know the nose is in both directions did you say somebody asked that no i want to ask it i want oh. someone to answer other than chris and guy who i think know the answer Trying to save paper space. Well, <laughs> well, I but... that the reason it does that is because uh, it is uh, a general line, and all the other things like waves and two faced lines and uh, three and one lines are just special cases of a general line. And I like what you're saying there. Um, it doesn't save paper because he it caused Guy to draw one more formation in the document and one more numbered thing. <laughs> but the point is we are callers communicating either with our definitions or, and in fact, generally our starting and ending formations. We shouldn't have general line in the document unless we're trying to be pedantic and cover everything we've ever thought of unless there's some call that starts from a general line what call starts from a general line well tag the line for one but that's the point the reason we need a general line is because that's the starting formation for tag the line if you were to look at our original basic definitions or basic mainstream definitions and you were to look at our initial our original formations document if they were well done starting formation listed or to understand what those words mean you should be able to look up a corresponding pictogram in the formations document and that isn't the case and it still isn't the case today that's the main reason why we need a formations document that's accurate the, now go ahead i was going to say back in the heyday of of flooding the the creativity of new calls um the word general line was very handy when i tried to describe something to you is it starts in a general line because right some things did <laughs> but the old time callers had never heard or used that phrase 
Yes. So that was alien to them and was just being introduced by, you know, people who were ruining square dancing. Um, so um, they still don't understand why we need to do this, but I'm giving, you know, kind of reasons and rationales. Now, the what should be included in the formations document guy struggles with this all the time there's always people going you didn't draw my favorite screwy thing or if we have a b and c and they form a little matrix but we never use d in that matrix why don't we put that in and then if you look at some of the names of the calls and the alternative names i'm sure you'll find some that you've never heard used in your life and yet someone else in a different area of the world commonly uses it and wants it included. So where you draw the line, there's not a crisp line to draw of what goes in the document and what doesn't, or what we call these things. It's a little bit like the, the trail we went down when I started giving command examples in the definitions document. And people said, well, if you use this and this, then you've got to add this, this, and this. And I've heard people say this, and I'm like, yeah, but drawing a line here and we're kind of using mm, good judgment or, or something like that. And that was a hard, you know, uh, aesthetics. That's a hard thing to come up with. Um, so, so that's why certain things are in the document. And the main thing is to have what's in definitions for starting and ending formations. Those words have meaning by being able to look them up in the formations document. I think that's the main tie together. I, I have a question about naming. Um, one particular formation is the eight chain through formation. I've called it that for years, but people are talking about, I'm trying to keep up, you know, when I'm teaching my mental image class, I say, you're in a, you're in a box one, four or zero box or an eight chain through formation or a corner box, whatever the latest terminology is, I, you know, whatever you understand, I'll use all of them. But corner box seems to be the latest thing. Why isn't it a an eight chain through formation? Granted, it's a specific facet that's the corner box, but why isn't it the corner eight chain through formation? Or why isn't there continuity there? I don't know why there isn't continuity. No one has ever come to me. I've never heard the phrase corner eight chain through formation. I don't know if no one's <laughs> come to me and said, I want that. Um, but the terms corner box and zero box uh, contain relationship information. And it's, if we took it, it'd be strictly the charter of this document, not to address sequence and relationship or arrangement, just formation. But given that to the brand new caller who doesn't know anything about this, wouldn't it be better to call an eight chain through formation a box? I don't want to change it, but I'm just pointing out the the lack of continuity there, the lack of uniformity. I, I don't have the right word. But. Okay, so if you're seriously suggesting that an eight chain through formation be referred to as some kind of box, I will be happy to take that to formations committee and see what they say. Please, please don't. I like eight chain through formation. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I, think the, I think the general answer to your question is that languages are not are not regular, and they're not uh, and and uh, people are not uh, computer programs, and so all languages are full of all kinds of irregularities, um, and uh, that's uh, and you know they're just conventional you know cultural things, and that's one of them. Yeah. Has that bothered anybody else, though? I'm curious. Well, I, you know, I, Bill Davis wanted to call it B1C for years and years and years. So, right. you know, he, he wanted to do everything by FSR. So he, he's already been, he fought that battle, I think, for probably half of his life. And, uh, you know, what it ended up as a corner box or it ended up as an A chain through, I don't know, but it ended up different than he wanted. And Bill Bill Peters had yet his own naming system, which when I took over his notes, I tried to keep consistent and was kind of difficult to have yet a different system. But yeah, as the token newer, 
But as the token newer caller, I uh, I have to think every time somebody says eight chain through formation, both because I hate that call and because I think of it as boxes rather than eight chain. But yeah, They're stacked boxes. Yeah. It's good. It's good that for seeing about it. <laughs> To answer Keith's question with the heads past the ocean, step through versus pass through, et cetera. Um, both the formations and the definitions are giving you logical, you go from A to B to C in a stylized way, not the perfect path and the perfect spacing and everything. And it's hard enough to even for them to even get that right. And then there's a section of the definitions called breathing. And it's the square breathing that covers all the adjustments and guy touched on it a little bit. And I'm sure if we were to ask him, he could come back and give a whole talk on just the square breathing part of the definitions document, which has been partially written, reviewed, and is actually looking pretty good. Um, but we talk about it as callers, but trying to write down what all, all, all of the breathing that we do is, et cetera, is hard. And if you were to try to write a program like Taminations, you can see Taminations has incorporated a bunch of kind of square breathing ideas to make itself look a little less clunky. Um, but I think the answer is the breathing part doesn't belong in the formation pictures and the breathing part doesn't belong in the explicit definition of the call step through and pass through and you turn back. Sure. It does belong in, the, belong in the breathing part. It is what and it is. You, yeah. yeah, and if you don't divide it up that way, then you're gonna be writing, drawing lots more diagrams and making the definitions lots more complicated. Instead, the diagram should be simple. They're on a grid. There's no breathing in them. The definition should be simple. You're moving grid to grid if there's calls like pass through and, and so forth. And the actual, hey, when you're in an ocean wave, you should be able to put a broomstick between all the dancers' bellies, which yeah. I've heard some callers say. Um, that is an artifact of you know, styling and breathing and not handholds and not anything to do with the explicit definition of how you get from point A to point B, or the explicit, here's the footprints on the floor for this formation. Yeah, well, you said a lot. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing, as, a, as I, I'm kind of like half newer caller and half, uh, half older caller because I had a long lapse. So my newer inner, my inner newer caller uh, just realized uh, that years ago, I'd be watching some caller work a floor and maybe doing a workshop or something. And all of a sudden they'd say, hey, you guys tighten that up. I could drive a Mack truck through there. And come to think of it back to when I was starting to learn how to call and calling the dancers, they would automatically adjust, you know? So it's something, uh, it almost is something that dancers teach callers, not the other way around. Uh, it's uh, the experienced ones know how to keep their formations, join hands, this, that, and their thing. The newer dancers, well, that's what angels are great for. <laughs> I was wondering what they were great for. Um, I've just noticed the hour's up. I'm going to do the traditional thing here before I throw in a couple of comments I have. But um, thank you guys all for coming today. Uh, Guy, let's have a big hand for Guy Steele and a, a nice presentation, good thought provoking and, and interesting to know what's on the horizon. Um, Guy, we'd love to have you join us on some of our other things. We've done over 90 of these and they're very diverse in what we do. Um, and it's a fun group to get together and, and chat about things. Um, if anybody, as, as you know that I, announce these on some of the Facebook Square Dance related groups um, Thursday before the Saturday session. I've just started sending out an email to anybody that's interested, that's not on Facebook, that's interested in um, knowing what the topic is and uh, 
reminder of when it is and with a copy of the same link every time. If any of you are not on that list already and would like to be, just drop me an email and I will put you to that list. There's no commitment to showing up, but it's a reminder. Um, I think those are the gen oh the usual if you've only dedicated an hour to this feel free to go without embarrassing yourself or without offending anyone else as some people have done already um and with that i have a couple of questions one is about square breathing and taminations i'm probably you're aware that if you've run a sequence on taminations in the sequencer and then tap on a particular, click on a particular dancer, you can see the path they've taken. And it might be interesting to observe the, the um, square breathing that, that Brad has put into that. Um, another case of, if you want to watch a case that he hasn't done square breathing, call or type in heads right and left through while sides promenade or promenade half and they promenade right over the heads of the sides it's very fun to watch um chris i'll get to you in a minute but the we were digressing i'm glad keith is basically still here about pass uh step through versus pass through from waves and and if you want a left-handed wave you really have to call step through because pass through is not legal there's something that I used to call that I thought would be obvious to dancers and it wasn't an untalking experienced plus in A1 and, and C1 dancers. If I have parallel right hand waves, I can call pass to the center from there. But when I had left handed waves, sometimes I would call step to the center, which meant step through in the leads partner trade. It was obvious to me, but it sure wasn't to the dancers. Clark, why not? <laughs> or anybody? <laughs> maybe, was... maybe because, he, I mean, we know step through, but step to the center. If you had that... said step through to the center, I might have done it. Right, right. That's what I was going to say. But I don't do pass through to the center. I say pass to the center. <laughs> But step has too many meanings. I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah, not to me. <laughs> I guess I didn't know C3 and C4. Just a, just a thought, digression. What if you do press ahead to the center, honey? <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect then, Don? <laughs> From right-hand waves, right-hand parallel weight. Step through in the leader's trade. And, of course, the centers are going to think their leaders are their box of four. But... Never mind. <laughs> Go ahead, Clark. Um, from right hand waves, um, next dance, try extend to the center and see if they extend the tag and have the outsides trade. I think that one's going to have more success than step to the center. I don't think uh, I don't think any of those are going to work because to the center sounds like a uh, sounds it doesn't sound like pass to the center is a weird name for the call pass to the center and uh, to the center in English uh, doesn't have anything about people not coming into the center doing something. And and uh, as you say blah, blah to the center, people are, are, are gonna think that everybody's going to the center or, or something, but it's, they're not gonna think anything about outsides trading. <laughs> it's just, it, it, I can, you know, to me, it was logical step to the center when I had parallel left-hand waves, but I can still look, see the, the looks on, what what is he talking about <laughs> uh, so much unless somebody else got a comment on on that digression yeah i do go <laughs> i've got a bit of a i don't have many pet peeves but one of them is with the call pet, uh, pass to the center and my peeve is that it reinforces a bad habit that we try to break dancers beginning dancers of which is if they're on the outside of a square and they're facing out they get nervous and want to turn around and pass to the center says, even though we didn't tell you to do anything, we're asking you to trade so you'll face in. And they may begin to think that, oh, that's the expected behavior, when in fact, that's exactly what we're trying not to teach them. Yes, well, of course, uh, what, what you really mean is they want to randomly uh, trade or turn around or something on the outside on any call other than pass to the center. <laughs> yes, 
So actually, you stand I, out there and you have to go, hey, finish the call. Oh, yeah. Yeah, beginning basic dancers, you know, just have, have this internalized rule. I don't like stuff going on behind my back. So I'm going to either turn around or trade, whichever will make me a normal couple. Because I also want to, I want to be normal and I want to be facing in. But, you know, we... It's we, a hard habit to break. We sort of teach that. I teach it early when I'm teaching dive through. Um, but, you know, I make a specific point. Both both parts have a part. The, the centers have the part of making the arch, stepping forward, and turning around to face back in. But I agree with you. The people don't like, don't trust themselves it's, when they're it's facing until, out. It's not until many years later when they think to themselves, oh, there's stuff going, behind, going on behind my back, and it's really cool, and that's what I'm paying the guy for. <laughs> <laughs> There are other calls like that too, like run, where you direct the call at, a, you've seen to direct the call at one set of people, but the, those not designated also have a, a part to play. But you just oh. need to talk about that explicitly. But I, the point of the pass to the center is a really weird case and not a pattern that we want to generalize, I think. Oh. On run, we talk about the runner and the runny. Some people get the run around, but Chris, you've been dying to, to say something. It, it was just a, a, a remark I had in uh, passing when we were talking um, about the uh, square breathing stuff and you meant, and also you had mentioned uh, the contaminations running the people down on the uh, heads promenade. And uh, so I taught uh, three beginner classes in the last three weeks. And, uh, uh, and is, so, I mean, just a passing note, the first time that we teach them square breathing is probably heads promenade halfway or heads however far you have them go. Having having just uh, taught that <laughs> three times. Well, yeah, again, I just, you, you teach, when I say heads promenade half, I said sides, you also have a part to do in this. And right, right. That. But yeah, that's a good case of, of square breathing. The rest of the time, of course, I'm trying to herd them closer together. <laughs> So one of the things that fascinates me is when we tend to move away, from, train, change media, and the the notion of trying to capture all of the permutations of something in a paper document versus a living document is interesting. Also, the way that for a lot of newer callers, contaminations becomes the definition, even though Brad would be the first person to say, no, it's not. Um, so I just wonder about the the notion of documents becoming something more than on the paper to where you actually could capture the permutations of it in in the document without having to draw out every single variation as you expand that list. Um, if we use some other kind of media than static uh, static uh, glyphs on the page, if we had a uh, you know, certainly we could do this and we could even do this, you know, 30 years ago, maybe, but, um, the, uh, but, uh, but people aren't, uh, uh, people don't commonly have, well, maybe they do now actually with the HTML and everything, maybe you could, but I'm not sure how much of a pain in the ass would be to do this, but you could have, you know, uh, the, the def, uh, the formations document, for example, be animated like contaminations is. And, and, and it would be possible to not have a space issue. Oh, we can't have 70 million pages. Well, you don't need 70 million pages. You just have this one little chunk on the page that's showing uh, generalized lines and you could just scroll through it to see every formation uh, variation on that, on, the, on that one. And you, know, you could just flip through them or something. Um, yeah, but, I definitely but, think- but, that but it's just a paper constraint these days. Yeah, I definitely think that technically and socially we aren't quite there yet but we might be close yeah you could do it with you could do it with html but i mean i don't i don't know that there's a handy tool lying around for that and and, and not everybody's going to read this on the web believe it or not some people are going to uh do this on um uh you know a piece of paper <laughs> i was uh i've been working on a document that i wanted some hypertext in because i had a you know table of contents at the beginning with a bunch of things and trying to create hypertext without knowing HTML, just knowing about it, 
Um, I did this document in Word and finally decided to save it as HTML. And the hypertext worked, but converting Word to HTML, the diagrams were stored in a separate folder. And when I did it on my screen, it worked fine. When I had somebody else look at it, they didn't see the diagrams. Um, I finally found a way to do it with having Word convert it to a PDF. And there are two forms of PDF it can be done in. And the hypertext is working and the diagrams show up. But it, it wasn't as simple as I thought it should be. Um, there should be a document, uh, an app that would, would allow you to create those things um, more easily. Mickey, you should go back and watch the video it was the, of this when I know you normally have to show up late. Um, Guy, Mickey's in Germany. Um, and you're, it's a, a really good good presentation that Guy made. Um, I know you're going to make comments on it because you always do, even though you didn't see the, <laughs> the presentation. We'll listen to your comments on it next week on this week's presentation. I don't know how to put it. Anyway, um, any other comments while we while we've drifted from topic enough? Anybody got any um, hyperlink? Uh, I'll just say another another thing is that the uh, and uh, a guy or Clark knows a lot more about this than than I do, having actually done that work. But the uh, in terms of the technology and the media and how those diagrams get produced, um, there's a uh, uh, it's uh, it's not easy. There's uh, you know there's a sort of inertia in. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, how they've been produced in the past and exactly what programs you use and how you do it. And then there's other uh, uh, constraints that people have having to do, maybe this uh, with, uh, I'm not sure, this might be more for the definitions, but having to do with, uh, you know, I think multi-language or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, ADA, you know, impairment type uh, constraints. And anyway, there's a, there's a whole lot of uh, constraints I understand on exactly how they're able to produce these and and you know uh, and, and that's that's even beyond the arguments about how should it look and you know what should be included but may, maybe they'll uh, maybe they'll mention that but anyway production uh production and bundling of of uh documents in general and these in particular is uh uh never never as, as easy or trivial as you might hope slightly tangent subject but many years ago maybe 40 years ago people had created computer fonts that had both men and women facing in each of the four directions so that you could cr create diagrams by just typing in this font does anybody know of anything that exists like that right now Unfortunately, I don't hear anything. That I, it is quite possible that characters which would be appropriate to this exist in the Google Materials uh, fonts, which are often used for buttons and such on various web pages, uh, but pro probably only by combination. Wouldn't be that hard to do, but it's always difficult. I think it's more difficult these days in tools to do things by font character or font glyph rather than by uh, by just carrying a picture around. I know that drawing square dance diagrams has kind of been a bane of my existence for ever since I started producing handouts with with definitions for a group of dancers back in probably the early 80s. And then Don came by and wanted diagrams for his book. And we had some technology there. Um, and then color lab documents and how the initial diagrams got drawn and then carrying them forward from word perfect into word, et cetera. And then other people use tech um, 
as a typesetting language and a set of macros there. And the guys and Bill Ackermans of the world have improved on that and Steve Gilday and Guy can speak to what he uses today, but um, I'm glad I got out of the definitions business when I did because I couldn't keep dragging my technology forward in terms of scripts and stuff that I ran under Linux and whatever. Um, it, it's a real pain. And I think where Guy is, is probably the right new future. Um, and, and he's fortunate that he can use that technology and probably even get it through Color Lab and published. So that's, that's good news. Why don't you talk about it a little bit, Guy? Uh, sure, yeah. Was, unfortunately, I'm, the computer that I'm zooming on is not the same as the computer I do these, this document work on, or I would show you some of the source files for this document. Um, but essentially, the, uh, the, the workflow is that I can use uh, SD. Uh, to create diagrams. I just literally call sequences to SD until I get the diagrams I want. And then I can literally do a text copy and paste of SD's output into my text editor buffer. I use Emacs. And then I have custom Emacs macros that will then take an SD diagram and transform it into something that is still recognizably an SD diagram, but is decorated just enough that it can go into a tech document. And so, um, so the source code for this uh, document is a LaTeX file within which the document, the, uh, sorry, the diagrams are actually pretty readable because they look like SD output. Hey, uh, so is it, uh, I, um, so I was actually hoping you'd talk about this. So I was curious, the, but you're not using, you're not using the, the, the LaTeX, uh, uh, Thing to generate the diagrams they're, they're, they're coming over as uh, an, an image or uh, characters in some funny font or something from from SD they're coming over they're coming from SD as the ASCII characters oh are, oh, oh, oh okay there are then latex macros in a file called latex squares dot sty so 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 that so that starts out the SD output is actually a uh, little um, uh, just ASCII normal keyboard characters yes. so and with the, like the little B hats and the, uh, yeah. Yeah, one B greater than two G caret, you know, right, those right. characters. And then I've got a big pile of the tech macros that take those character strings and generate uh, the, the diagrams that you see from those character strings. Uh, okay, cool. And yeah, that was months of programming, but I did that years ago, so. And we thought calling was tough. <laughs> that also allows me to, uh, the fact that tech is programmable allows me to, um, I'm going to share the screen again, uh, get some pretty interesting effects. For example, this, you should be seeing page 15. Yep. Yep. Uh, so you can see how the diagrams are four across, except in some places, there are only two across at the bottom. And here in the middle, I've got a quarter of the width, a quarter of the width, and then a half width diagram. What did you say? Oh, I was and, just talking to them. And triple columns needs more depth than triple lines or triple boxes. So it can do this irregular thing. If I skip back to um, uh, the very first page diagrams, these diagrams are four across, except in the first line, they're six across, because I've got room for that. And if I had not done six across on those, I could not have crammed basic and mainstream onto two pages. There's actually a lot of flexibility in the layout of these boxed diagrams. And again, you know, that took weeks to program. But now, now that I've done all that, it's very flexible and I can make new arrangements very quickly. So it's a lot of work to build good tools. Once you've got the good tools, then you can revise very quickly. And that's that's an advantage. Um. There, there's probably only uh, there's probably only uh, three or four people here who who know that word that we keep saying tech um and it's a uh it's a, a typesetting language um that's actually a programming language uh and uh so you can uh you can build up whole little macro packages of uh of things like he's talking about and if you see it written down it'll it'll look like the word text uh but it's uh tau epsilon chi 
uh, in Greek. But uh, anyway, that's tech. And its companion book, La Tech, which is not showing. Here we go. Yes. So this book is always at my side. The um, a bit of history, but when when I was writing out of sight, and Clark was make, making it into digital kind of stuff, um, diagrams of dancers didn't seem to be too hard for him. But where I would draw a diagonal elliptic path through several dancers, I had in my mind what it should look like, and he would put a diagram in there. And then I, I clearly remember Clark standing over your shoulder where you had a light pen on the screen. And I'd say, well, make that breathe a little forward this way and a little more this way. It may be symmetric the way it is, but it's not the way I want it pictured. And, and I'm not sure how long light pen technology was around, but it was fascinating to watch you doing that at the time. Yeah, apropos of Guy's talk today, um, all the diagrams I had done on a grid with no breathing but the diagrams for your book you um you wanted you wanted you know facing couples to be stepped back a little bit and so forth so you had the breathing built into your diagram so you'll notice that throughout your book um i don't think we, we used also the breathing then <laughs> no we didn't and, but we also had um and by the way uh can guy can you just put up a um one of your diagrams in the new document for a sec, like just an ocean wave or something. Um, I had a term that I used when I was drawing pictures for the for the color lab documents. Um, I want I want wavy ones. Uh, just go down to yeah, go down I've yeah, that's good. One. Yeah, so, so let's look at right hand ocean waves. Are those circles all in a straight line? The answer is yes. Correct. Yes, there, there is another style in which you make it so that the length of the dancer, including the nose, lines up. Exactly. So, and, so the bodies are slightly wavy. Yeah, and I call that um, body-centered or nose-centered or something. And I have an option in one of my drawing programs to do it either way. The advantage of not doing what you have here, but we would move them all just down, you know, just a little bit so that draw a bounding box around them and the noses would touch in both directions the bounding box if you do that the waves look slightly wavy which tends to please the people who like waves to look wavy enough that maybe they'll let you go without making them as extraordinarily wavy as they like to see them but that's a whole nother decision is are the people on a grid and then when i drew don's dancers don with his arms point outward when you had dancers who were nose to nose with the arms pointing outward especially you know it didn't matter whether it was the curvy u's or the v's that the guys are we had this weird eye artifact that was happening at the tips of the arms and you and so forth and you we actually had to space the dancers further apart to have that weird um thing that your eye does not happen um, yeah, there's the extreme waves, right? So um, yeah, it took a lot of of micro tweaking or tuning to get Don's pictures to look good um, and be happy for him. Um, and all the automated software I had wasn't as automated as it needed to be to accomplish what Don needed. Thanks. I can't help pointing out that uh, the the nose centered dancers where the noses touch the bounding box. Uh, oh, do you have one of them? No, I don't have such a diagram here, but I just want to point out that one feature of that kind of diagram is the same problem as with more extreme versions with the arms held up front, which is that it makes lines and waves look pretty good, but things like diamonds and hourglasses look all Yeah, funny. yep. Or even, I like, I think that right-hand column you have there looks awful. Oh, yeah, this is terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as I said, look for the triangles. There they are. Yeah, yeah, right. Lots of right progressive tandem based triangles circulate seven times or something. Yeah, right. it could be a and weird thing. Yeah. And actual it, dancers it, are not offset quite that much, but pretty close. It's surprising. Yeah. As a mechanical engineer, I just keep seeing pulley systems there. But. Uh, 
it looks to me like uh, uh, like uh, something you'd find in a magazine where it's like, look at this for you look at this for five minutes and watch the <laughs> weird thing happen with your eye. Yeah. So Dan, Dan, are you getting ideas on how to how to make the dancer part of Square Desk look different? Um, well, I think that what we're going to end up doing on Square Desk is trying to uh, integrate. Um, directly yeah. directly rather than trying to continue to anchor off of SD. I was going to try to take the animations from uh, Taminations and use those as the transitions for SD as our engine. But I also realized that the further I took this stuff out, the uh, I still don't have the right mechanism for kind of uh, managing choreography snippets. And as I become better and better at calling off the top of my head, it's becoming less and less important to me. So I haven't figured out what I actually want to do with the the outputs and the saved information from each of these uh, each of these stages and each of these tools. I just figured that today's discussion, especially the after discussion, would would help muddy the waters even more. But. <laughs> All I'm thinking so, about right now is uh, what is the bounding box concept, and can you have a bounding diamond also? And how does that do exactly? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so let's it, talk about standards for just a little bit. Actually, go ahead, Dan. No, take it away, Clark. But you haven't talked as much. Yeah. Well, you have better things to say. Okay. Um, to call them 1P, 2P, and box 1, 4. And that came, as I remember, from Lloyd Littman and was a notation he used in a book called Instant Hash. And that was the nomenclature for quite a while. But then Bill Davis discovered a bunch of stuff and came up with his thing, which Keith can articulate, but I never could learn and it never stuck with me. And apparently Bill Peters had something. And then Color Lab came around and people like Bill Peters and Bill Davis were parts of early Color Lab. And Bill was a pretty clever guy. And which, which I remember, uh, I'm sorry, Bill Davis. I'm sure I mean, Bill Peters they, was also, but they, they I didn't know were, him as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Bill Peters has a PDF out Peters or Shades Davis. of Gray, which is worth getting and reading, and you can learn a whole lot about him and his life and calling and everything. What did you mean, Peters or Davis? Bill Peters. Oh, okay. So it's worth getting the Bill Peters PDF Shades of Gray. And Bill Davis, um, as I remember, was a Caltech graduate, and he always was amused working with us from MIT because there's always been kind of a Caltech MIT rivalry for engineering schools. And um, in my opinion, working with him when I was a new, you know, junior caller and, and new member of Color Lab um, and, and actually not impressed by any of the famous people because, well, for a variety of reasons, um, but trying to figure out where I fit in in this big organization and, and who would give me the time of day and where I could contribute, it ended up being places like the Formations Committee. And Bill seemed to know and have a sense politically of how far he could take an idea and what might fly and what might not fly. And he would get his committee to propose something and he knew that they wouldn't like it, but he'd propose it on a one-year trial basis. And that one-year trial basis was his way of getting stuff approved because then he would come back the next year and say, hey folks, we had this on a one-year trial basis and we didn't have any negative feedback and it looks like it's working for us. We'd like to put this up for permanent approval because back then, the entire organization had to approve every single thing Color Lab did. And that's how we step by step got formations approved, arrangements approved, and nomenclature like um, 
zero box and zero line approved. And I thought he was very astute in what he did. And then even though each caller and each note service might have had their own standards, once it was caller lab and so forth, that really did become the the common nomenclature that we can and should use and is taught in caller schools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not that people like me don't still think of it as box one four and one P two P. Um, but or zero, you know, I can use zero box. I can kind of convert to the newer stuff that you youngins use, but but that's that's how you get a standard out there. And that's why working within Color Lab for definitions or for formations, et cetera, is worth so much that once it gets approved, it's out there and pretty much the world accepts the Color Lab stuff as the standard. Yay, there you go. For, for what it's worth. Yes. For what it's worth, the two bills were very good friends, and as well as having square dancing in common, they used to go hiking in the Sierra together an awful lot. They, I mean, they were, you know, lived close together, relatively close. So it, it was, you know, the few times I got in the area, I got to visit both of them, and it was, it was really cool. It's all in that book. And, and a whole lot more like flow charts for resolving, you know, Bill, he was a programmer at heart, I guess. I don't know. Uh, everything uh, could be put into a simple process. Maybe it was a process engineer. I don't know. They, He's a very both, interesting guy. <laughs> they, they both wrote, both Bills wrote several books. And one time I asked Bill, Bill Peters, what's your next book going to be? And he said, Bill Davis is writing a book and mine's going to be a translation of it. Um, it was acknowledged pretty much generally around here by most of the calling community back in the 90s that uh, uh, if you were going to have a conversation with Bill Davis, it wouldn't be too long before it was over your head. And it was very, it, you know, it was very difficult to just walk up to Bill and have a casual conversation. It was would always lead off to some some complex aspect of life or square dancing or something like that. Uh, he had uh, quite uh, quite a, an amazing mentality. That's all Bill, I'll say. <laughs> Bill, Bill Davis, I think with John Sobolski, did an awful lot of working and thinking together. And later, um, Bill and Kip Garvey. Yeah. Uh, Kip's relationship, I think, wasn't as well known with Davis, but, but they they did a lot of deep thinking into to various parts of what's. Well, they taught a caller school together, and that's the one I went to. Uh, and uh, well, Sobolski, he was another one that was pretty up there, you know, but a much a much broader, better sense of humor than Bill. Bill was kind of dry, uh, but uh, Bill Davis and Kip Garvey taught a caller school together. And the way a typical day went is when a concept needed to be related to the newer callers, Bill would take off and explain it and just go in many theoretical great and wandering circles. And Kip would come back and then he'd say, well, now here's my take on it. And generally everybody understood what Kip said. <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> it was an experience. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> Chris? Um, I was just going to, I was just thinking uh, uh, about the whole uh, business with um, the uh, the naming and the fazers and what have you. And uh, the, uh, when I started, uh, when I started to learn to call, um, the, the very first thing I was learning was uh, the mental image system. And then I would also write material, you know, using checkers, actually not checkers, like diagrams, same thing. And, but I, but I didn't, uh, but one thing I didn't use uh, really at all uh, was modules um, because uh, at least at the level of calling I was doing, I didn't need them. Um, <laughs> I mean, if, uh, uh, if I was, uh, you know, calling a, you know, plus level or whatever, uh, I, I just did all that stuff on mental image. And of course, that has some constraints. But but in any event, the whole time that I was learning uh, how to do that, uh, 
the the amount of communication nomenclature that I needed was very little, uh, basically none. Uh, it was much later on uh, that I uh, encountered uh, all these different naming conventions, and I asked uh, one of my mentors, it was probably Ackerman, and said, "Hey, what's uh, what the hell is this?" And he said, "Oh, don't worry about that crap. All you need to know is one P two P is this, and box one four is that, and and of course, lots of the material that you're writing." Uh, personally, uh, you'll, uh, you know, it's going to start from 1P2P or box 1,4. That's really common instead of starting from a squared set or something. But, but we, but we, you know, we, ju we just didn't use my, if I needed to talk about a, um, uh, uh, so what, what the hell do you call it? Uh, I'll just tell you the way I would say the Across it. the street box. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. I, that's, I, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I, I just, uh, you know, I, I, the, the way that would come up in conversation is in talking to is in working with my uh, uh, my uh, mental image mentor Ackerman or Don, uh, and uh, and we wanted to and it wouldn't be so much uh, trying to describe a module, but we would try to follow along in our heads with each other, and that way they could check to see if I was doing it right. So so I would just walk over to somebody and say to one of these guys and say, uh, okay. So I, you know, check me on this. You know, head square through two. Okay, now you know, swing through boy run. You know, boys, whatever, girls trace something. Um, but I would just, we would just start calling, and so we were sort of, you know, one way of doing it is the uh, the double pass through formation to name it after the formation. Um, but uh, but we could take it. We could, I could get you anywhere in the square we wanted, and I would just call you there. You know, in three calls or whatever, and that's how we that's how we would communicate about that. And then when we were done. You know, it would be uh, uh, it either be yes, you're at the correct element left spot, or you're on one of these other spots, uh, or you know you're totally screwed up, and I'll have to describe to you in painstaking detail that you're at you know in some particular place. But but we but we just didn't need any of that nomenclature, um, and I think most of it is uh, almost all the nomenclature about the uh, formations, and certainly the the whole phaser thing is is all about modules um uh and uh i just uh, not everybody uses modules despite what uh <laughs> I mean, that's a philosophical discussion but but i'm, I'm going to say not everybody uses modules and uh oh, but the, but there's a huge emphasis um and and i and i'm not sure how if that's always been the case uh on modules and that's that's what drives a huge amount of that nomenclature as as Clark was saying, a lot of these terms are needed not for calling dancers, but for callers to communicate with each other. Yeah, that's that's all I'm talking about is callers and, communicating with and each is, other. And isn't this great? Who needs dancers? I mean, we can just we can just dance in our heads here. Which visions of sugar plum fairy? No. <laughs> but to that uh, to that point, one of the things that I've always uh, or that I looked at the the diagrams carefully for especially when they're laid out by dance program was that oh yes um diamonds don't aren't are are start at the plus uh category on that which is why dan uh, why the student dancers find spin chain through so difficult because spin chain through is the first place that they run into diamonds even though they're not labeled and even though it's a temporary formation the thing that confused the hell out of me when I was a beginner dancer was stars, because I couldn't, I could never, I had a hard time when I was in the square, seeing how far I was supposed to go. Um, and uh, it, it, some of it seemed a little fuzzy. And it, and it wasn't until later when somebody came along and said, well, they're just sloppy diamonds. And, and then I understood a lot more about stars. <laughs> but, but I think that also speaks to something that Don and I have had the occasional message back and forth on uh, talking about various videos that we find on the net of people calling is that calling stars well really depends on extremely good timing. It's entirely the caller's fault. And uh, yeah. R remind me where a circle left ends. Right. <laughs> I, I want to second the comment about stars. They always confused me. And I think it comes from old style calling carried into modern Western, where you can do things like, you know, 
heads make a right hand star, you know, turn it something with the sides make a left hand star, heads back to the center with the right hand star. Like I'm used to where's the call start and end and which way are you facing? Whereas um, traditional squares and especially contra dancing doesn't have the concept of this absolute, this call ends here. You know, when you dance a hey, you know, you can do a hey from here and go off in a diagonal hey over there. Um, you can almost have your, your ending position in some cases up to 180 degrees wrong and still blend into the next call because the walkthrough shows you how the calls connect together. And I think stars are an example of that. And yet stars are so simple and many of the callers who are older, long time experienced had seen them used in the other things and know some of the routines. Therefore, we have to have stars in our basic list and define them and have pictures and use them. And yet no information on how to actually use them. Show us the 10 routines that do work and those are the only ones we'll ever use, but that never happens. The, the reason I don't use stars in classes or, or party dances or for quite a while in, in classes is as we talked about, it doesn't end in a particular place. It depends on the timing of when you call the next call. And since newer dancers don't always start the star at the same time, you know, this star, this square may start right away. And that one's thinking about their handholds in the middle before they start moving. So the timing for one square to say to your corner with the right and left through is totally different than the timing to another square. So I just leave I call stars and and circle stuff sloppy calls um, versus precise calls and and leave them off until dancers, you know, I I've always said that one of the things of distinguishing easy choreography or basic standard choreography versus difficult stuff is formation awareness and guy alluded to that several times in his talk. Um, you know, head square through, do a bunch of things with the sides, and then all of a sudden split circulate across the square. Oh, there are other people in the square too. You know, it, it's got to be, you've got to be aware of the rest of the square formations. And the newer dancers just know who's on this hand and this hand. I use uh, stars at uh, party dances and uh, first night uh, beginner type things. Uh, all the Both. time, but I only use, uh, you know, some people, whoever it is, boys, heads, whatever, star in the middle, and and I directionally tell them where they're going back to, you, you know, you're going to go back to go back and find your partner, you know, so that the timing is, uh, you know, whenever they get there is fine, but they they know who their partner is, and you know, it's interesting to me that um, when I when I call stars. At, at places uh, where it's where there's no square dancers and they've never seen anything before, probably they've seen something on TV or so. But but you know non dancers, brand new people, and um, uh, you 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 tell them something like uh, you know circle left, everybody circle right, single file, all the boys step in, make a left hand star. They'll just do it. Nobody nobody ever goes, what's a star? They're always like, okay, <laughs> just stick their hand in and do it. Um, it's uh, it's got to be uh, the formation is got to be outside of circle. Uh, it's uh, like the most intuitive one uh, apparently that there is for English speakers anyway. Mm -hmm. Chris, you're you're in the majority. I'm I'm the only one I know that has troubles with them, but I do fine by leaving them out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but. You can use a circle of four instead of a star if you want to. And Taminations doesn't like them either. <laughs> I use I use circle of four uh, a lot at, uh, yeah. on on those kind of things. Very, it's a nice, powerful call. And and uh, uh, well, I'll tell you, it's it's easier than than anything uh, to teach either a first night or maybe a second night dancer. Uh, uh, circle to a two-faced line, which is supposed to be what, like a C2 call or something like that, but they just, they'll do it. If once they know veer to the left and once they know circle, they'll do it, you know, and they, ah, <laughs> uh, uh, but will your mainstream dancers do a single, um, single circle to a two-faced line and the star through? 
Well, no, no, come on now. <laughs> We're having a discussion about that these days. One, one thing about stars that that makes things work reasonably easy is if you have the heads make a, a right hand star and then come back by the left there, you know, till you get back home, the timings of the square that started late is going to reverse in the other direction coming back late and it's going to be about the same beats of music for them so they'll still land at home um but i still find it easier not to <laughs> gotta teach them those grids <laughs> we don't realize it but we're really having an extended discussion on uh social square dancing and and how and why it can be made interesting without using a whole bunch of calls that they that they already know you know by teaching them how to do stuff that they don't know with using the directions that they do. It's fascinating. Well, I think if we had a Saturday session, I've got next week planned, but then the next 72 weeks or not. If, if we had a session on bring your, let's say everybody bring two or three um, party night figures that you use that um, hopefully there won't be too much overlap and we can add to our very, very basic party night, second night of class kind of choreography. Does that sound like something that you would come to with or without stuff? I taught a, uh, I taught a first night class Thursday uh, because uh, it's a group that normally dances um, uh, alternating mainstream plus advanced. Um, and uh, sometimes there aren't plus dancers and sometimes there aren't mainstream dancers. Sometimes there aren't advanced dancers, but, uh. but, if every, but if everybody showed up, we'd go, you know, mainstream plus advanced, mainstream plus advanced or something like that. Uh, kind of depending on the mood of the people and how many relative proportions of dancers and whatever. But anyway, last night it was, um, uh, I guess everybody that showed up was plus and then walked in some new guy who said, oh, I, I got a flyer at some community event uh, out the celebration back in June there. And I, and uh, it said, you guys, and I, so I, I came over and I, oh, I did square dancing once upon a time. Uh, now he didn't mean modern Western square dancing or anything. Um, and um, uh, I, I'm not sure he actually meant square dancing either. It might've been some folk dancing. Anyway, he's the, the guy walked in cold and he has done some kind of dancing, right? Um, and um, so we did, uh, uh, by the end of the night, uh, he was doing, uh, and now this is of course with a square of angels and he's the only beginner uh, and he's real sharp and and what have you. But uh, But in terms of first night figures, by the end of the night, he was doing figures like heads right and left through lead to the left and veer to the right and bend the line and couples circulate and lead to the right and chain down, you know, veer to the left and chain down the line and ladies chain all different ways and all this and, and you know, stars and circles and promenades, the whole promenade family, and weave the ring and whatever. Um, so, you know, what you what you can get, what you can get through on a first or second night is tremendously variable. I've always loved when I've had, you know, one or two squares and I notice they square up they're plus dancers, except some are advanced or challenged dancers, and all the advanced and challenged dancers are side couples. And so I'll call something for them specifically and watch the expression on the head couples' faces of, huh? <laughs> but, I, I did that in the uh, I did that in the singing calls. I had the sides were plus dancers, and and uh, he was in uh, he was at the head position, so we could have you know, uh, you know, sides square through four or whatever to. Or, yeah. or, have fan the, or fan the top and recycle or whatever. I don't know that I would bring anything to that, but I would be interested in that uh, because yes, I have had my, I, the Petaluma group when I was running it, uh, we ran it as a, if you walk through the door, you dance. And a couple of times my experienced dancers would tell me that they're getting really tired of star throughs and California twirls and can we please do something else so <laughs> the main problem that I have uh when when doing a group like that thing last night with a bunch of with a bunch of angels is that 
uh, is that they anticipate all the throwaway, break, easy choreography, you know, let's all start with circle of the left. Okay, sure. But, you know, if, if you call something like uh, weave the ring uh, to a do -si do to a right and left grand, the angels flip out. They're, you know, they're, they're not well behaved because they're just like, oh, we, you know, we did this call. Now it must be time to swing or promenade or whatever. They just, because we, because uh, they're, they're so unused to uh, any, any, any variation of the, you know, the, of the throwaway, if you will, material uh, that, that, uh, that they actually have trouble. <laughs> it's funny. I just, I'm just reading the chat. Yeah, we can talk about that later, Mickey. <laughs> but it's, I'll, I'll send you some, some links of how nicely things were handled. Um, an hour ago, I did the usual one hour thing. I'm going to do sort of a, a new usual two hour thing is I'm going to bow out, guys. Um, you can keep going if, if Dan will let you. But uh, if I could find the cursor, I'm going to click the leave. You all are welcome to carry on as long as you'd like. Thank you very much, Guy. I appreciated the presentation. And also read all of your books ages ago. And it was cool to run into you in a different context. And uh, and um, another thing is when you you talked about your pipeline for into getting into LaTeX, I think you know maybe it would be cool to have continuity on some of those other tool things because there are a bunch of we who do the command line and Emacs and things like that often end up with environments that only we can use. And so when we leave that project, there's a whole set of things that are no longer possible. And I don't know how we document that and create something that carries on in that front. And I'm thinking about that as I continue to work on Square Desk and Mike continues to work on Square Desk. Um, how do we make it so that other people, that, that it's a product or project that continues on beyond us, not just the, the end product. So anyway, if you'd care to document that at some point, I think that'd be cool. Yeah, that is on my mind. Uh, for the uh, Caller Lab challenge documents, we have generally been um, drafting those in LaTeX and then converting them to Word. And we have a tool chain process that converts all the diagrams. So the diagrams are generated by LaTeX, but then they're inserted as PNGs in the Microsoft Word document so that those familiar with Word can at least update the text. It doesn't solve the problem updating the diagrams. Mm -hmm. For the formations document, it's all diagrams. It's not clear that's worthwhile. And so that does become a concern. Right. Cool. All right. Well, unless anybody wants to take hosting privileges, I'm uh, ready to go on and get on with my other things of the day. Great. Talk. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Oh, guy thank already. You. Oh, no, there he is. He's still there. Thanks, guy. That was a nice talk. Yep. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank, guy. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Bye, all. Hey, Yoli.